COVID for the public at home, if the revenue forecast points out $60 a barrel oil, under Alaska state statute, credits are paid at a calculated rate of 10%. When the calculation or the forecast, I should say the forecast, falls below that 60, tax credits specifically are paid at 15%. The current revenue forecast is projected at around 59, Senator Machiki, I'm looking to you, 59 something, uh, which creates an increase on our uh, operating expense line. So uh, those that might be waiting for receipt would see that uh, as a good thing. Uh, those that want additional investment in Alaska see, might see that as a good thing, but what it's doing, and others are pointing out, is if the national average for the price per barrel of oil is actually in the 60 to 65 range, that would reduce the operating budget call, which will be good or bad, depending on your perspective, and would show actually <clears throat> increased revenue coming into our state. And so there is a variety of opinions on how we should look at this. And I just want Alaskans to know we are trying to narrow the gap so that we understand what the range of possibilities look like. Senator Machiki, comment? Madam Chair, the only comment I would have is, is um, so I've been, I've been here six years and when I first came on to finance, we pressured uh, at the time the state was using a very rosy outlook on the price of oil and production um, that overestimated revenue and they sort of um, used it. That's the number that was used when we thought about what an affordable budget looks like. And at this table, we, we certainly pressured the administration to become more conservative. They've become very conservative in the outlook of price and production, um, in many cases overly so. That's all well and good, but we have to look at this in a realistic range. So these numbers now are being used in a way to evaluate the need for new revenue. And we just have to remember that, that those assumptions come with a range. And that range is likely um, by looking at the international energy, energy outlook from the EIA, um, the Energy Information Administration is likely um, overly conservative, and we'll talk about that a little later, I think, in the presentation. But I just think it's important for folks to realize that these are not necessarily, as we go to the charts, giving us hard facts. This is a conservative range, um, and in, in many cases, it's sort of a kind of worst case outlook. Thank you, Senator Machiki. And if I might point out, legislative finance, who works for us, is trying to give us an apples to apples comparison of. Uh, a particular set of criteria that's before us and so the public needs to know the criteria uh, that underlines uh, underlies some of these issues. Mr. Teal, please continue. I'd like to clarify something before I move on to expenditures and that's that I think you'll recall that in the forecast when DOR released its forecast last year it was a 12 percent decline as Senator Machiki noted and that was because they hadn't revised the production forecast, but only the price forecast with, when they went from fall to spring forecast. They later said that the production numbers were stale, and that was the 12% decline scenario that we were looking at, which we never used in the model. Because Senator Machiki and others pointed out that that seemed pretty far from uh, the facts as they were unfolding. And I think the, the legislature and everyone else agreed that the 4% decline scenario was probably more reasonable. That's not an error on anybody's part. That's simply uh, a judgment call that turned out to be correct. The error that we refer to, and I, I guess I always wanna be careful when you start talking about errors because then people wanna point fingers. There's no big error here other than the fact that the diversion of insurance premiums to the health care reimbursement fund is a bill that sunsets in FY18. So that premium money will begin going back into the general fund. Department of Revenue simply overlooked that fact in publishing their out-year projections. So there's no serious error here, it was an oversight that is now corrected. So 
bottom line is that last year we used the 4% decline scenario, we matched revenue, except we added about 65 million to it. This year, we match the official revenue forecast exactly. So there's, there's no argument about the revenue numbers at all that I'm aware of. Mr. Thiel, and sometimes we fail to uh, make this statement publicly, so I would like to say that I believe it's the last three years now, or is it the last two years that we've actually send, seen increases year over year in production, and that we are on track uh, to do that again. And so we will be looking to uh, the administration to see when that becomes a reality inside or an actual trend inside of our revenue forecast book that we're not trending down when we've had three years of actually an uptick of production. Okay, so now turning to expenditures, slide four also shows that projected expenditures are different than we used last year. In fact, they're up by a cumulative $934 million from 19 through 26. Now, we can go into details about what that is, but, but essentially, um, inflation at 2.25% is built into these numbers, as are uh, the increased oil tax credit <coughs> contributions that you mentioned earlier. Note that from FY18, where we needed to, to put in roughly $75 million into that fund, the 19 required statutory minimum deposits, $175 million. So that oil tax liability accounts for a great deal of the increase in the expenditures that you see on slide four. And of course, the revenue and the expenditures combine to give you the deficit, and you can see that with lower revenue, higher expenditures, the deficit is increased, and here positive numbers mean the deficit is $173 million larger than it was in last year's model, going up and then, then declining, and by 26, it's actually reversed. Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. And what was that deficit last year? The, uh, drawing a blank on that, I mean, I get... Uh, without the structural draw. Without the structural draw, it's somewhere around 2.8 billion, depending on... 2.8 billion? So uh, we'll see that in the, in the next slide because it, it hasn't changed a whole lot, actually. So uh, if, if you want to just wait for that slide and, and talk, about, talk about the third major change in the assumptions that go into the model, uh, when Commissioner Fisher was in front of this committee, he explained to you that Callan and Associates, our, our ad investment advisors, had recommended that the permanent fund use a lower rate of return than the 6.95% that we used last year. He didn't specify what that amount was. He talked in terms of inflation plus some. So it turns out that um, the permanent fund release projections uh, dated September 30th, which now use an anticipated rate of 6.5 percent. And, uh, and while, Madam Chair, I just wanted to point out that um, this is the impact on a deficit uh, that is going north, but the, the actual deficit is substantial. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. So, Senator uh, Machicki. Just back to the middle row, uh, Mr. Teal. It, it, so looking at the uh, numbers that have been plugged into the fall forecast for oil price, the price forecast doesn't have us to $60 until 2021. That was dropped that down fairly substantially from the spring forecast. Yet you're, you're assuming larger credits on actual price beginning in FY20. 
Is there a reason you didn't match the tax payment liability to the price forecast from the Department of Revenue? Uh, through the Chair, Senator Machiki, we did match. Our, our revenue numbers in the model match the Department of Revenue's official forecast exactly. The expenditure forecast that we're using matches OMB's 10-year expenditure plan, which does build that in the change in the oil tax payments into their expenditure plan. So it, it's accounted for, I mean, the, the tax credit payments show up as an expenditure, and, and, that, and it's included. Senator Michigan. It just looks like it's accounted for early by a year or two. And uh, it'd be interesting, it's interesting to see the background slides on that, see when they start plugging in the higher oil tax payments. Through the chair, they start plugging those in in 19. And that's why you don't see an increase from 19 to 20. Um, but there, of course, is an advantage to those higher tax credit payments. And, and that is that instead of continuing to make payments for years out into the future, the expectation is that the credits will now be paid off in 2025. That means that your 2026 and, and 27 deficits uh, decline substantially. And in the models, you'll see that we're now showing that in 26 and 27, um, where we flip over and now and have budget surpluses in those years, Senator depending Bishop? on the assumption. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I could be totally off base, and you can <clears throat> blow me right out of the water, but I'm going to make a comment. So these credits we're talking about, those are the credits that are still owed. Are we just correct? Madam Chair, that's correct. And this body tried to pay these credits how many years ago? So, I mean, if we could have got them paid when we wanted to pay them, we 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 these deficits would be a lot smaller going forward today. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Thank you. If, if I could, as a follow-up, I see Mr. Peterson on behalf of the administration is sitting in the audience. If we could have confirmation that the calculation in the OMB 10-year forecast, and it, our finance team has already confirmed that you've done that, but if we could just have a follow-up with Senator Machiki, reflecting whether the uh, uh, the 15% uh, payback is what's in the forecast going forward, or if it drops back to the 10% for the tax credit uh, inside of the 10-year formula from OMB, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Teo, please continue. Those, um, what, what we then use in the model is the official de uh, Department of Revenue forecast and the OMB spending plan and the permanent fund projections, that determines the base case of the model. Um, you may be tempted to overstate the impact of the decline in permanent fund earnings. Uh, after all, losing half a percentage point on a $60 billion fund means earnings are down by $300 million. That's a lot of money, but you also should know that FY17 was a very good year for the permanent fund, and that, uh, well, let, let's just use some numbers instead of trying to explain it conceptually. Um, 